Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here, and I want to thank very quickly uh, Vicki and Tom and uh, Margie for helping us out. Uh, I'm so pleased that we're past 100 people. Uh, again, the group that Vicki identified just a few seconds ago, our purpose is to celebrate the Constitution, just like on July 4th, you celebrate the Declaration of Independence. Um, over 55 presidential elections have come and gone. In a few days, another election will be over. But what must never end is the United States Constitution. The question is, can you put up with me two nights in a row? Uh, we are doing this tonight, and the theme of this is your questions. Tomorrow night, the theme is going to be the Supreme Court. If you like firewalls separating one night from another, that's not going to happen. I already have a question here that Paul sent to me earlier today, and sometimes it's difficult to separate the Constitution and the Supreme Court because... Uh, no one here tonight, none of the over 100, not myself, not Vicki, not Margie, not Tom, none of us uh, say what the Constitution means today. Only nine people do that. And that's very important. And so sometimes it's difficult to separate the piece of paper from those people who say what it means at a given moment, and that is the justices on the high court. Um, let me just quote to you very quickly what Charles Evans Hughes said uh, back when he was on the court as Supreme Court Chief Justice. He said, the Supreme Court does not get the last word because it is perfect, but it is perfect because it gets the last word. So keep that in mind uh, as we go forward here with a new justice on the court. And of course, that's been true since day one. Um, so tonight our topic is your questions. Tomorrow night it will be the uh, United States Supreme Court. Let me just mention a few things real quick. Uh, I was looking through the amendments today and there's 10 amendments that apply to this election that is taking place with something like 59 million Americans having already voted. Please remember that because of an amendment, uh, African American males are able to vote in this election today. Because of an amendment, it is able for myself and you as well, regardless of what state you live in, and some of you are joining us from California, so it's only four o'clock in the afternoon out there, you voted not only for the president maybe already, if you've already voted, but you also voted for U.S. senators. You would not be voting for senators if it weren't for another amendment. That was the 17th Amendment which gave us the right to vote for senators directly instead of you voting for your state legislators and then telling you who your senators were. Another amendment that I looked at today, which applies to this presidential election is, if, if Donald Trump wins a second term, he's then done. It's the 22nd Amendment. It limits presidents to two terms. Also, the people in Washington, D.C., only since the decade of the 60s, are able to vote for the president of the United States. When I voted and my wife voted by mail, we did not have to pay so much money to vote. It was true up until the 1960s in Southern states, you had a poll tax that was eliminated by an amendment. And for those young men and women putting their life on the line for this country in Afghanistan and Iraq, if they're only 18, they can vote because again of an amendment. And then the amendment, they got a lot of publicity in the last couple of months, 50% of the American people, American women, would not be able to vote in this election if it weren't for the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote for President of the United States in 1920. So there's at least 10 amendments out of the total of 27 that apply to the election that we're experiencing right now. Let me start off with this question here that I received earlier today, and then every once in a while, I'm gonna to go to Margie. Uh, what you do is you send the questions, uh, and they'll put them in the chat box. And then Margie, every once in a while, I'll go to her and she'll read the questions out loud. But here's the question I'm gonna share with you. Can you please discuss the topic of packing the Supreme Court? How is this constitutional? Was the court not established as part of the constitution? If so, why does the packing not require a constitutional amendment? Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. There are seven parts to the United States constitution. And we should mention those very quickly here. Uh, the first part involves Congress, the second part involves the President, the third involves the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is in the Constitution, but that's all the Constitution mentions, the Supreme Court. The Constitution, you can read the entire document in probably an hour and a half, maybe less if you're a speed reader. It is a very general document. It lacks, it lacks specificity. 
And so all of the judicial positions set up underneath the U.S. Supreme Court was set up by a later law passed by Congress. So the first part of the Constitution, the first article is Congress, second is President, third is the Supreme Court. The fourth is the relation of the states to each other. If I get married in New Jersey, that marriage counts in Pennsylvania. If I get divorced in Florida, it counts in Nevada. So that's the relation of states to each other. Uh, if I adopt a child in Florida, it's just as good in South Dakota. So one is Congress, two is president, three is the court, four is relation of states to each other. If you show me a constitution that cannot be changed, I'll show you a bad constitution. We can change our constitution. That's article five. I mentioned to you just a moment ago how in this election we have going on now, which is eight days away, there are 10 amendments out of the 27 that are related to presidential elections. That's a good constitution. You should be able to change it. Things are not gonna be uh, uh, as they are now in let's say the year 3029. Article six of the constitution involves the supremacy of the national government. And article seven talked about how the constitution will go into effect once it was ratified. And then you have the 27 amendments. The first 10 being the Bill of Rights, and then after that, we added those from 11 to 27. Six of those 27 amendments were added in my lifetime. So while it's difficult to change our Constitution, it's doable. I just turned 70 not that long ago, and six of the 27 were passed in my lifetime. Let's go back to Paul's question. Paul's question involved the United States Supreme Court. So first of all, Paul, the answer is yes, the Supreme Court is provided for in Article Three of the Constitution. But like I said, it's overall a general document, not a very specific document. The Democrats are saying that if they get into office, they're going to add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight judges to the U.S. Supreme Court. Does that require an, an amendment? Absolutely, it does not. Absolutely, it does not require an amendment to add judges onto the United States Supreme Court. Um, we have had, in the beginning of our history, we had six justices on the high court. We then went to seven. We then went to nine. We then went to 10. We then went back to nine. And we've been in nine since 1869. So there's nothing magical about nine. We've been at six, seven, nine, 10, and now we're back to nine. Um, this discussion of adding justices onto the court is because obviously the Democrats feel ripped off, Merrick Garland never came for a vote and so on and so forth. Uh, whether they're going to do that or not, I have no idea, but it does not require an amendment. We've changed the constitution in the past, the sky did not fall, et cetera, et cetera. I would, be, I would mention this, that if you were a fan of um, uh, the late justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, she mentioned a number of times before she passed away that she thought that the court should be left where it was at nine. If the Democrats in the Senate attempt to change the number on the U.S. Supreme Court, it would probably be the biggest attempt to change the number of judges on the court in a significant way for political reasons since FDR tried to pack the court in 1937. And please remember that if they go down that road, they meaning the Democrats in the Senate, uh, it could be quite chancy. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, had the American people behind him. Uh, he won a gigantic landslide in 36. Uh, everybody seemed to be supporting him, except for what he called the nine old men on the high court. And so he then attempted to change the court by adding a justice on for each of the justices that were 70 or older. That would have meant that he would have added six justices on, six that he thought he knew how they would vote. However, however, the Senate and the House, controlled by his party, the Democrats, the American people, and the media all said no. It was the biggest, most humiliating defeat Franklin Roosevelt ever suffered in his entire political career. Please don't get carried away and say, oh, after that, every, everybody was opposed to FDR. My gosh, he's gonna win two more presidential elections. He's gonna win in 1940. He's gonna win in 1944. Uh, he leads us through World War II, et cetera, et cetera. So don't get carried away and say nobody liked him after he tried to pack the court. And you could also argue this, that while he lost the battle, he won the war because by the time he died in April of 1945, he had put eight of the nine judges on. So you could argue that he got the last laugh. 
He lost the battle, but he won the war. What I think may come out of this discussion right now, and I'm not sure Joe Biden's a big fan of the idea either, uh, again, uh, obviously talking about appointing a commission and so on and so forth, is what you might have come out of this is uh, a limiting a number of years that justices can serve. Instead of serving till they are 90, as John Paul Stevens did, and uh, other justices, Oliver Wendell Holmes, didn't retire from the court till he was 90. Uh, again, uh, as I said, I, I'm now past 70, and 90 doesn't seem old to me at all. But maybe it's time that what we say is uh, they've, they've come up with the number of 18. And if we start in, enforcing that idea of 18 years and then you're off the court, it would mean that almost every president, even if they only served one term, would get to put two justices on. So maybe that's something that will come out of this rather than packing the court, but a limit on the number of years that a, 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 a justice can serve. Again, we're not going to be able to separate this nicely, only do the Supreme Court tomorrow and the Constitution tonight. But we'll try to focus more on the Constitution since tomorrow night is devoted to the United States Supreme Court. If you have questions, please send them in, because I'm going to be stopping quite often to ask Margie, Margie if she has uh, questions for us. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to do that right now. So, uh, Margie, do we have uh, a question or two or three? Hi, Greg. Yeah, we have a question on the word impeachment. And what does that word mean and what's it synonymous with? Okay. Let's talk about that. Um, James Madison, who should uh, get most of the credit for the heavy lifting of writing the Constitution, uh, James Madison said that uh, if we were all angels, we wouldn't need a Constitution at all. But we're not angels. You know it and I know it. Uh, it's not just politicians, it's just everybody. We're all sinners, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Founding Fathers, who had been around the block a couple times, put into the piece of paper that the country's built on, the piece of paper that has given you all the rights you've ever enjoyed since the day you were born, they put in the impeachment process. The word impeachment means accuse. It does not mean convicted. So we've had three presidents impeached in U.S. history. The first president was Andy Johnson, who followed Abraham Lincoln. The second president to be impeached was um, Bill Clinton. Uh, and the third president to be impeached was Donald Trump. So we've had three presidents accused of breaking the law in U.S. history, and all three were acquitted. So we've had three accused, and we've had three acquitted. We've had three accused, and none of them were convicted. So every time you hear the word impeach, which if Donald Trump had not been impeached, it would be a word that you rarely would hear, it just means accused. So the House of Representatives is the one that impeaches or accuses the president by a simple majority vote, because you're not convicting, you're just accusing. It then goes to the Senate. If you and I were trial, on trial for murder, there'd be 12 people in the jury box. It would take 12 out of 12. In the case of the U.S. Senate, there's 100 senators. To convict a president, Andy Johnson, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, or President Joe Smith 100 years from now, it takes two thirds of the US Senate, which means 67 senators must be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that the president is guilty of sin on a particular charge that he's been accused of. 67 out of 100. They failed to get 67 with Andy, Andy Johnson, they failed with Bill Clinton, they failed with Donald Trump. Let's just suppose, let's make believe for a moment that any of those three presidents had been found guilty. What is the punishment? Even if they had been accused of murder on nationwide TV and the evidence was overwhelming, the only punishment is removal from office and you may never hold an office of public trust ever again as long as you live. However, since the impeachment process is considered a political process, if a president had been convicted, Andy Johnson, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, if they had been convicted, now, they're out of office, they're John Doe, you can nail them to the wall on criminal charges. And it is not considered double jeopardy, in case you were thinking of going down that road, okay? When the president's on trial, the chief justice sits as the judge during the trial. So in the case of Bill Clinton, it was uh, William Rehnquist. And in the case of uh, Donald Trump, of course, it was John Roberts. So the judge is the chief justice, the district attorney or the accuser is the House of Representatives. The jury is the Senate. You need two-thirds of the Senate to convict. 
and the only, only punishment is removal from office and never can hold a, an office of public trust again. So that's the impeachment process. In the case of House members and Senate members, uh, you know and I know we, we learned this back in eighth grade that we have a system of checks and balances. And so to uh, check the president, there's the impeachment process. To check House and Senate members, they discipline their own. So if a senator or a House member was uh, just uh, you know, guilty as anything of egregious behavior, it would be up to the House to expel that member. It would be up to the Senate to expel that member. The Senate runs its show, the House runs its show, the President runs the White House, and the nine justices run their show over the Supreme Court building. None of the branches tell the other branches what to do. They have their own set of powers, et cetera. What makes this, the, the president strong is a number of things. Uh, one thing that makes Donald Trump strong, or maybe Joe Biden in the future, are those things called the Great Depression and World War II. In case you're wondering what in the world could they have to do with today's presidents, during the Great Depression, when you have one out of every three of us would kill for a job during the 1930s, et cetera, and when you have the largest world war in U.S. history, power in large chunks gravitated to the presidency. So those, that's a defining moment. Some people say there's all the presidents from Hoover back to Washington, and then there's the presidents from FDR on. So we have a gigantic increase in the power and the prestige of the presidency, starting certainly in the 1930s with Franklin Roosevelt. Later on, you have, they have their own plane, Air Force One, you have more Secret Service protection, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a bit of a turning point, the Great Depression and World War II. The president is commander in chief. Donald Trump never served in the military. Joe Biden didn't serve in the military. Barack Obama didn't serve in the military. That's not a requirement. If you're born a natural born citizen, you're 35, you're good to go. You don't need a college diploma. Abraham Lincoln never went to college. Grover Cleveland didn't graduate from college. Harry Truman didn't graduate from college, et cetera, et cetera. George Washington never went to college. If you're 35 and you're a natural born citizen, you're good to go. You don't have to be a person with military experience. However, once you win the job, you outrank everybody. You are the commander in chief. So for the President of the United States, what makes them powerful is those two major events in the 20th century, the Depression and World War II, and also that they're commander in chief. What makes the Congress powerful, what makes my wife powerful in our house is she controls the purse strings. She controls the money. I have no idea where the money comes from. I have no idea where it goes. She writes the checks. I don't know what's going on. That control of the money in our whole household makes my wife extremely powerful. What makes Congress powerful is you can't spend a dime unless Congress says you can. So what makes Congress powerful is the purse strings. What makes the president powerful is he's the commander in chief. What makes the Supreme Court powerful is Give me some time, I'll think of something. Well, the reason I say it that way is because way back when our nation was beginning, Alex Alexander Hamilton said it so well, he was concerned about the Supreme Court. And he said uh, something along the lines, the president has the power of the sword, the Congress has the power of the purse strings, what power does the Supreme Court have? So the bottom line is the Supreme Court doesn't have a single soldier, they don't have a single cop, they don't have a single penny, they depend on you and I, you and I, who want to live in a civilized society and not ruled by those people who can bench press more than anybody else to obey the laws and the decisions that they make, even if we don't like them. If they make a decision and you and I don't like them or lots of people don't like them uh, and there's resistance to those Supreme Court decisions, then it's up to the president to do his job, which is to enforce the Constitution. Please remember that if you have been in the military, and I see uh, Don on the screen with us, and uh, Jim uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Youngstown, I know some of these people, Ohio, and I see uh, 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 Pete over here from State College. Uh, if you've been in the military, you know you take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the piece of paper we're talking about tonight, the United States Constitution. You don't take an oath when you join the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard to defend Barack Obama, Donald Trump, or Abraham Lincoln. It is the piece of paper, the piece of paper, the piece of paper. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. 
So in the case of the United States Supreme Court, if they make a decision and it's not obeyed, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, John Kennedy promised to do one thing, not more money for Social Security, not more money for Medicare, one thing, to preserve, protect, and defend the United States Constitution. And if you want a perfect example of that, I'll give it to you in my lifetime, maybe your lifetime too, I don't know how old you are, but in my lifetime, in the mid-1950s, Eisenhower called out the 101st Airborne and they forced the state of Arkansas to allow those nine African-American kids to go to Little Rock High School. It didn't matter if Arkansas didn't want to do it. It didn't matter if the, the governor of the state, Orville Faubus, didn't want to do it. You are going to do it because the Supreme Court said you're going to do it. But since they don't have a single cop or a soldier, it's up to you, Eisenhower, the guy who led the D-Day invasion. It's up to you to do your job. And Eisenhower did his job. I will also give you an example of the most blatant, the most blatant disregard of the Constitution by any president in U.S. history. And then we'll stop again for questions. And that was Andrew Jackson. There were Indians living in Georgia. Uh, they got a lawyer. It went to the Supreme Court. They did not want to be moved again. What we wanted to do was move Indian tribes uh, to west of uh, the Mississippi. We wanted to move them to Oklahoma. I could crack a joke about Oklahoma, but we might have somebody from Oklahoma that's joining us tonight. But nonetheless, they wanted to move them to Oklahoma. Um, and that was the decision uh, that they wanted to do. They wanted to move them. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you've made, your, you, you've made this treaty with them. America's built on people keeping their word and keeping contracts. You may not move them. Um, when they, when they, that, that law should have been enforced, that they were allowed to stay in Georgia, et cetera. They asked Andrew Jackson about Chief Justice John Marshall's decision about not moving the American Indian. And, John, and Andrew Jackson's response was, John Marshall, he made his decision, let him enforce it. And they moved those Indians from Georgia to Oklahoma, and you know that becomes known because thousands and thousands will die going from Georgia to Oklahoma. It becomes known as the Trail of Tears because so many thousands die. So if you want a perfect example of a president who should get an A-plus for doing his job and enforcing the Constitution, it's Eisenhower with Little Rock in the 1950s. If you want a perfect ex example of the opposite of a president not doing his job, it would be Andrew Jackson allowing those Indians to be moved air to the Supreme Court said they should not be moved. So uh, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Uh, we're going to go to Margie. Margie, another question here. All right, Greg, if we wanted to elect our president via popular vote, as opposed to the Electoral College, how would we change the Constitution in an amendment to provide for that? Okay, uh, I, I've had my own small business since 2007, and I travel around the country. Uh, even now, I was just to Ohio last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but obviously it's been restricted. But I always, you know, pull the leg of people I'm dealing with and I say, how many people in this group have voted for President of the United States? And of course, everybody raises their hand. And then I tell them, no, you're all wrong. You've never voted for President of the United States and neither have I and I haven't missed an election. Uh, you vote for the electors and the electors only, only the electors vote for the President of the United States. We can change the number of judges on the court to 1,050,000, 25, you don't need an amendment. You could do it in five minutes. However, if you're going to get rid of the Electoral College, that will require an amendment. That will be amendment number 28. And let's talk about how you change a constitution. Again, as I said earlier, show me a constitution of any country on the planet, and there's about 195 countries. If they have a constitution and you can't change the constitution, shame on you. It's a bad constitution. Having said that, if we want to change our constitution, as we've done uh, 17 times, how do you do it? You need two thirds in the House to say yes to your idea. You need two thirds of the senators to say yes to your idea. And you need three fourths of the state legislatures to say yes to your idea. It is difficult. I'll be the first to admit that. But if your idea is so wonderful and so popular and all your friends tell you it's the greatest idea they've heard since sliced bread, you could argue you should be able to get two-thirds in the House, two-thirds in the Senate, and three-fourths of the state legislature. 
we've done it 17 times. Uh, we did one, it only took a few months. That's when we lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. I guess the founding fathers figured that they did not want us to change the piece of paper that has given us all of our rights uh, just because we were having a temper tantrum. So for women to get the right to vote, two thirds, two thirds, three fourths. To get rid of poll taxes in the South, two thirds, two thirds, three fourths. To make Congress wait until after an election before they can collect a pay raise, which is our most recent amendment, two thirds, two thirds, three fourths. You don't need an amendment to add judges to the court, not at all. But we would need an amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. One of the reasons um, that they may be passed, they put into the Constitution the idea of the Electoral College is to, as I think one of the founding fathers, and I'm not sure which one said this, he said, we want to avoid the excesses of democracy. The excesses of democracy. Nothing occurs in a vacuum. Nothing occurs in a vacuum. There has to be some context for it. What was the context of those people getting together in Philadelphia to write our second constitution? Because we all know the first one failed. The first one being the Articles of Confederation. We had lived by that constitution for eight years. In that constitution, they did not have two chambers in their Congress. It was unicameral. It was unicameral, not two chambers. And all of their major decisions had to be unanimous. But after eight years, it wasn't working. And George Washington and the boys knew if we didn't make drastic changes, there would, no, there would be no America going forward. So they got into Philadelphia for two reasons. One, throw the first constitution in the trash can, the Articles of Confederation. And the second reason, and maybe more important, was the terrific reputation Philadelphia had for its cheesesteaks. Those were the two major reasons they got together in Philadelphia. <laughs> Having said that, uh, once they get there, think of the context of the world. There are emperors in Asia. There are kings and queens in Europe. The idea of giving the average slob on the street the ability to vote for his leader directly with no checks at all, it's preposterous. There has to be some check on the masses. You had some of the founding fathers talk about the average person having the dirty fingernails and so on and so forth. They're not bathing often, often enough. We can't trust them to vote for the top guy or in the future top gal directly. And so they inserted a middleman. And that middleman is the Electoral College. And please don't think it's just with the presidency. As I mentioned to you earlier, if you've already voted or you'll be voting next Tuesday, you're going to be voting through a middleman for president. If you go back to 1913, you also voted through a middleman for your U.S. senators. Because back in 1913, they added a new amendment and they got rid of the old way, old way being before 1913, and that was you voted for your state legislators, you know, Albany, Sacramento, Harrisburg, Tallahassee, whatever. And then they got together and told you who your two senators were. You say, well, suppose I didn't like the two that they chose. Tough. They chose them. So you didn't vote for your senators directly until 1913 and the 17th Amendment. You don't vote for your presidents directly now. No American has ever voted for any president in the past. And unless the Electoral College is removed through a 28th Amendment, uh, we will still be voting indirectly for presidents in the future. Excuse me. Every once in a while, I take a little time. This is vodka, it's pure, it's good. <laughs> All right, I wanna remind people at this time, if you have a question, just write it in on the chat so that we can get Dr. Farrow to answer it. But we have another question yeah. and it has to do with uh, the Alzheimer's Amendment. Like how, what happens if we have a president that is incapacitated in any way? Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Um, that's been a topic of conversation through the mid-Atlantic states and my other Zoom presentations, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's one of the most discussed amendments, I guess, in the last year or so. From the time our nation began until my lifetime, 1967, uh, we played Russian roulette with our executive leaders. Some people would argue that it doesn't matter about Hillary in the last election. 
we've already had our first woman president. Her name was Mrs. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson suffers a terrible stroke. His last year and a half, he's not in good shape. He refuses to give up the presidency. Shame on him. His vice president doesn't want the job. His vice president was uh, Thomas Marshall. The only thing Thomas Marshall is known for is a quote that he made at one point in his life. He said, what this country needs is a good five cent cigar. That's the only thing Thomas Marshall is known for. So the vice president doesn't want the job. The president refuses to give up the job. Somebody's got to do something. And Mrs. Wilson takes over and runs the show for the last year and a half. She ran cabinet meetings. She fired what was probably Woodrow Wilson's only close friend, a Colonel House. She said that the president no longer needs your services. Thank you very much. Your last day is Friday. Have a good life. She ran the country. We're talking about Wilson's second wife. His first wife had passed away when she was first lady. She died in the White House. So this is Wilson's uh, second wife who's running the show. In the case of John Kennedy, imagine they pull off a miracle at Parkland Hospital and he survives, but he has serious mental issues. Uh, how could he go forward? I have no idea. That was before 67. When Eisenhower has two heart attacks, one in his first term and a much more serious stroke in his second term, what do we do? Well, we just uh, muddle along, play Russian roulette. Luckily, Nixon took over and did a nice job. But the bottom line is, from the days of George Washington until the 25th Amendment, we played Russian roulette. When Franklin Roosevelt is in declining health those last six months, we're just hoping that he can maybe somehow make it through his last couple of years. Finally, finally, in 1967, my lifetime, maybe yours, they passed the 25th Amendment. And it took what all the amendments take, two thirds, two thirds, three fourths. And this amendment tries to cover the base of two things. One, presidential disability, whether it be mental or physical. And secondly, we want no more empty spaces in the vice presidency. Let's do the vice presidency first, then we'll do the, the uh, mental and physical problems. When Lincoln is assassinated, Andrew Johnson takes over early in Lincoln's second term. Uh, who's the vice president for the next four years? Uh, nobody. Uh, when Warren Harding suddenly falls over dead in 1923, Coolidge becomes president. Who's vice president? Uh, nobody. Uh, when John Kennedy is killed in Dallas, Texas, LBJ becomes president. Uh, who's vice president? Uh, nobody. Uh, you say, well, who did the job that the vice presidents are supposed to do? Well, two things. One, you could argue vice presidents don't do much anyway. Uh, one of the things they do is they break ties in the Senate. How often does that happen? The other responsibility is to go to all the funerals of the famous people around the world so the president doesn't have to go to those funerals. Um, they tell the story of one, uh, one mother, she had two sons. Uh, one went off to be a, cap a, a sea captain, the other one went off to be vice president. She never heard from either one of them again, okay? Uh, so in that sense, uh, the, 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 the vice presidency is to quote one vice president, I don't mean to be gross, but I'm, I'm quoting John Nance Garner, he said it's not worth a warm bucket of spit. Okay, so think of all the times we've had an empty vice presidency, when Truman took over for FDR and so on and so forth. That will never happen again. That will never happen again. We will not allow it. The vice presidency has become too important. And so let me take you back to the early 1970s. It's Nixon and Agnew. Agnew resigns because of cheating on his income taxes, et cetera. If that was before 1967, there just wouldn't have been a vice president. But from 1967 on, we will not allow the vice presidency to be vacant. And so by the 25th Amendment, Richard Nixon had to go to Congress and propose a man who was highly respected by both chambers, Gerald Ford and Gerald Ford was approved. And so there's your new team, Nixon and Ford because of the 25th Amendment. About a year later, Nixon resigns in disgrace. Ford becomes president. But now there's nobody in the vice presidency again. That's okay. That's why we have the 25th Amendment. So Gerald Ford went to the House and the Senate and, and said, would you please approve 
uh, Nelson Rockefeller as my vice president. And the House and the Senate said yes. You now back to full steam. You now have Ford and Rockefeller as your president and vice president. So part of the 25th Amendment is there will never be an empty space in the vice presidency ever again, no matter what, from 1967 on. From 67 back, I've already given you examples of where numerous times we had no vice president. Let's talk about the other part of the 25th Amendment. I encourage you to read it yourself. It's very short. Suppose a president in office develops Alzheimer's. Reagan develops Alzheimer's after he leaves the presidency. But suppose in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, a president develops while they're in office. What do we do? This is the most powerful man on the face of the earth or the most powerful woman on the face of the earth in future years. What, what do we do? Before 67, your guess is as good as mine. 67 on, that's why we have this amendment. Here's what triggers this amendment to kick in. The vice president of the United States would go to the cabinet and say, have you seen the president the last two months? He's acting very, very, uh, in a very unstable way. I'm gonna remove him from office. For me to do that constitutionally, a majority of the cabinet would have to back that vice president up. If they do, you've removed the president in about five minutes and you protected the world and the country, end of story. That's the 25th Amendment. However, they, when they passed the 25th Amendment, they tried to cover all the bases. Remember, they covered no bases before 1967. So you may not like the 25th Amendment, but I would argue it's better than nothing. And what we had before 67 was nothing. Suppose if the president goes into retirement, he says, you know what, the job is a lot tougher than I thought, and he just leaves the field, no problem. But suppose the president says, whoa, hold on. I'm as good as anybody else. I can't believe that my vice president and my own cabinet stabbed me in the back and signed that letter saying that I was incompetent. They're a bunch of liars. I'm sane. I'm fine. I can do this. Well, now, who do you believe? Do you believe the vice president, who maybe just will not wait for his turn to be president? Or do you believe the president who said he's fine? What do you do in that case? The 25th spells it out. Please read the 25th Amendment. It's very short. 25th Amendment says this, if the president contests what the vice president has done to him and taken the presidency away from him, Congress would convene in 21 days, not 25, not 22, 21 days. And in those 21 days, they would decide to back up the vice president or the president of the United States by a two thirds vote. If they hit two thirds in both chambers backing up the vice president, he stays president and finishes out the term. If they fall short in either chamber of the two thirds necessary, the president gets his job back. So that's how the 25th Amendment works. We will never have an empty vice presidency again, never again. And in the case of physical disability, that's probably easier to see in a president. As far as mental disability, it depends on the vice president and the cabinet to get him out of there. If he goes into retirement, end of story. If he contests it, if he, you know, if he says, no, this is all a lie, it goes to Congress and they have to back up either the vice president or the president. They can't take forever. They have 21 days. What would they do in those 21 days? They might bring in some of the most respected uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. They might ask the president to come down to the Congress at the Capitol building and maybe answer 58 questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to hear any speech. We want to ask you 58 questions and see how you handle them and so on and so forth. And at the end of that time, they would vote to either back up the vice president or they would say, Mr. President, the job is yours again. The vice president should be ashamed of himself. There's nothing wrong with you. The psychiatrist said you're fine. We believe you're fine. You answered those 58 questions with no trouble. You answered it with a lot of specificity, et cetera. Okay, so that's the 25th Amendment. And we could have used it many times in history before 1967, i.e. Mrs. Wilson, i.e. Eisenhower in the 50s. But it is there, and it's been, and it's been used. It's been used. When uh, Ronald Reagan uh, went in for, uh, to remove so many feet uh, due to uh, colon cancer, uh, for a, a short time, Bush Sr. Uh, ran the country. When Bush Jr. went in for a colonoscopy uh, for a short time, Dick Cheney was running the country. 
Who gives them the power to do that? The 25th, the 25th, the 25th. Before 67, we played Russian roulette, but that's the 25th Amendment. Greg, uh, we have another question on the 25th. Okay. Is, it, is it that amendment that requires one cabinet secretary to be absent from the State of the Union address? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, the 25th Amendment doesn't mention that at all. That's a precaution that we started to take a while back. Uh, they then made it into a TV show, you know, The Missing Link or whatever it was called. I never watched it. But uh, the bottom line is, uh, I think our confidence has been shaken now uh, with 9-11 uh, and, and, and the pandemic going on and so on. We, we want to make sure that we're ready for anything in the future. And so when Barack Obama, Donald Trump give State of the Union speeches, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court justices are there, the, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is there, the House, the Senate, my gosh, it would be a perfect time for another, heaven forbid, 9-11. <clears throat> maybe not smashing planes, maybe using some biological agent. Okay, having said that, having said that, they always require somebody in the cabinet to be maybe 100 miles away in an undisclosed location. So if the horrible would happen again, we would still have a president, we would still have a chain of command, et cetera. Uh, we have a chain of command now, and it goes president, then vice president, then speaker of the house. Okay, so it goes Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Nancy Pelosi. Then after Nancy Pelosi is what they call the Senate, Senator, uh, the Senate president pro tem. And that's the guy named Grassley from Iowa. So that's the next person in charge. After Trump and Pence and Pelosi and Grassley, you then start going through the cabinet with the oldest cabinet job first in line and the youngest cabinet job last in line. So the oldest cabinet job is Secretary of State. So the next one in line after those four elected people would be uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. And the last one in line the very last one is the cabinet that we created after 9-11, which is the Department of Homeland Security. That would be at the, the end because it's the youngest of all the cabinet posts. So that's our chain of command. And that chain of command is spelled out in laws. It's not in the Constitution. It's spelled out in laws. It's statutes, not the Constitution itself. But that's our chain of command. So. All right. Um, Greg, what does the 20th Amendment say about election of president and vice president if contested results well let's talk about that and that gets to the that gets to the electoral college that we were talking about a little while ago so we okay let me go back here first of all there are a total of 538 uh, electors for joe biden to win it's the only thing he cares about since he was nominated and for donald trump to be elected it's the only thing he cares about is hitting 270 electoral votes. Whichever gets 270 electoral votes is the president of the United States. No ifs, no ands, no buts. It may be shocking to you, but if you carry the 11 states with the most electors, the 11 states with the most electors, you, you will hit 270. It doesn't matter what the other 39 states do, you've already hit 270. But you'd have to carry the states with the most electors. What determines electors? You get one for each of your congressmen, and then you get one for each of your senators. So I live in Pennsylvania. We have 18 congressmen. Every state has two senators, so we have 20 electors, okay? In your state, add up your congressmen, add on two senators, that's the number of electors that you have. Whoever gets 270 between Joe and Donald is the next president of the United States. But let's just suppose that uh, neither one get 270 maybe because of chaos, confusion, whatever the case may be. Uh, we've already had this happen twice in American history. The best example would be 1824. You had Andrew Jackson versus John Quincy Adams, and there were other people running. There was like a third and a fourth party. And neither one of them had the, the magic number of electoral votes to be declared the winner. What is provided for in the Constitution is it would go to the House of Representatives. So today we go to our House of Representatives. Once it gets there, they, the founding fathers didn't want to have California having more power and say as to who the president was versus Rhode Island. And so each delegation in the House only gets one vote. That's all, one. There's 
there's 40, 50 House members in California, but they only get one vote. Rhode Island gets one vote. Pennsylvania gets one vote. Not 18, just one. Whoever hits 51 first is the President of the United States. All you need is one over half. We're not talking make-believe. We're not talking Santa Claus. We're not talking Easter Bunny. It's already happened twice, in 1800 and 1824. In 1824, they went to the House. The House is going to choose who the president is. Each delegation from each state had only one vote. Andrew Jackson had the most popular votes. Andrew Jackson had, Jackson had the most electoral votes, but he didn't have the magic number needed, like today it would be 270. So in the House, there was a lot of wheeling and dealing. And when it was all over, Andrew Jackson, who had the most votes and the most electoral votes, lost. And John Quincy Adams was declared the President of the United States. And that wheeling and dealing became known as the corrupt bargain, the corrupt bargain. And people were livid. How can you go into the House with the most people and the most electoral votes and come out and be the loser? And so people nursed their grudges. And four years later, Andrew Jackson won by a huge landslide. And four years after that, he won by a second term. Uh, so that's, that's how that would be handled. And even though you haven't asked the question, I said to you our first five minutes together, there's not a firewall between the piece of paper called the Constitution, I would argue the most powerful piece of paper on the planet, and the U.S. Supreme Court, because it is only the court that decides what that piece of paper means at any given second. So let's be crystal clear on this. In Bush v. Gore, it all came down to Florida, or as they, the comics started saying back in those days, Florida, because it didn't seem like they could run an election and so on and so forth. And so Bush took it to court, which is his right. The Florida State Supreme Court ruled against Bush and said, we don't have a problem if they keep counting the ballots. Bush didn't like that answer, which is his right. He appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court did take the case. They looked at it and so on and so forth. And they decided that the voting of those ballots, remember the hanging chads and all that, the voting would stop when it stopped. Bush Jr. had 600 more votes than Gore. He carried Florida. It got him to 270. He was the President of the United States fair and square. Okay. That brings up two things. One, I'm going to get preachy for a moment, and then the other one is more important. The preachy is this. Seven days from tomorrow, we have a presidential election. 59 million or whatever have already voted. Donald or Joe might claim foul and this and that and who knows what. And so we may not know for a while. You and I, me especially, I can't speak for you, but I'm spoiled. I, I like to know right away the answer to anything. Please remember in your lifetime, if you're as old as I am, again, I'm past 70, we've already waited six weeks to find out who won. We've already waited six weeks. We waited till December 15th because in 2000, when it was Bush Jr. versus Gore in 2000, by the time the Supreme Court decided it, it was December 15th. From election day till December 15th, no one on planet Earth could say who the next president was going to be. So I would argue, I would insist, I would, I can't, maybe I shouldn't use the word, demand that all Americans be patient till at least December 15th. If you can wait till December 15th in 2000 to see who won between Gore and Bush Jr., we can wait till December 15th to see who wins between Joe and Donald. Also, and this is a personal opinion now, this is a personal opinion. Also, uh, it takes four judges out of the nine to take a case. You don't think that the 2000 election was the only confusing election we had. Back in 1876, we had an election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Sam Tilden. That election was so screwed up that three Southern states sent in their returns as to who won, and they sent in two sets of returns from these three states. If you look at this set, Hayes wins. If you look at this set, Tilden wins. Not one state, but three states did this. Talk about utter confusion. So the people in 1876 went to the court and they said, you gotta help us out here. Uh, we gotta swear in the president next week. We're running out of time. There's all this chaos and confusion. What should we do? And the Supreme Court said, we're not touching it. Have a nice day. And they didn't touch it, okay? 
I, I mean this seriously. I hope if Joe or Donald or both of them going go running to the Supreme Court and they say, oh, you have to intervene, the sky's going to fall, et cetera. And you know how unpopular Bush v. Gore was. There's a lot of legal scholars who thought they shouldn't have gotten involved in that one. I hope the Supreme Court says this time, we're not touching it. I'm sure you big boys and girls will work it out before January 20th. And if you don't work it out before January 20th, we have a president already set to go. Her name is Nancy Pelosi. Okay. Have a nice day. Okay. So I would, you know, we, how many elections have we run? I mentioned that in our first couple of seconds, we've had 55 presidential elections. We put a man on the moon. We, we should be able to do this efficiently. And if we can't shame on us, and I don't think we should be bailed out by the nine justices on the high court. This time it's all on us. Maybe this will teach us a lesson, and maybe in 2024, we'll have our ducks in a row and things will go smoothly. Okay. Uh, Another question, Greg. Go ahead, um, Mark. Which amendment has been used more times in cases before the U.S. Supreme Court than any other amendment? Well, that's a, that's a great question. We have had, we have 27 amendments, and sometimes the amendments come in clusters. They don't always come in clusters, but sometimes they do. Uh, so the first batch, the first 10, were the Bill of Rights. So there's a cluster of amendments there. Uh, then we have a cluster of amendments, the Civil War amendments, 13, 14, 15. 13 got rid of slavery forever. The 14th Amendment provided for civil rights. And the 15th Amendment gave African-American males the right to vote. Then we had another cluster of amendments. They don't always happen this way, but often they do. And these were the progressive amendments. The 16th Amendment requires you and I to pay our taxes every April 15th. I would argue it's our patriotic duty. It's our way of making sure the military is funded, et cetera, et cetera. The 17th Amendment I alluded to earlier, it provides for the direct election of US senators, not through your state legislatures. We had the 18th Amendment passed. The only amendment that we were so sorry we passed it, we passed another amendment to kill it off 13 years later. The 18th Amendment made liquor illegal, and after 13 years in Al Capone and gangsters, we later passed the 21st Amendment to kill off the 18th. So if you pass an amendment, and then years later, you decide you don't like it, you have to pass another amendment to kill it off. So if we passed an amendment to get rid of the Electoral College, that's fine. But if 15 years later we decide we don't like it, we want to bring the Electoral College back, you'll have to pass another amendment to kill that amendment off that got rid of it in the first place. In the case of the 22nd Amendment, that was passed in the early 50s. It limits all future presidents to two terms. And then the 23rd gave the right to vote to DC residents. The 24th got rid of poll taxes. The 25th we've already talked about. And the fastest amendment ever passed in US history, it took about six months. How can you get two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and three fourths of the state legislatures to do something in a couple of months? It sounds like warp speed. And that amendment said that if a young man is able to lose both his legs in Vietnam stepping on a landmine, then by gosh, he should be able to vote for President of the United States. No amendment in American history was passed as fast as that amendment, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. The idea was if you were old enough to die for this country, you were old enough to vote for President of the United States. But let's get back to that amendment the most used. The amendment most used in front of the U.S. Supreme Court since the year 1900 is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, which is one of those three amendments which I call the Civil, the Civil War Amendments. 13th got rid of slavery, 15th gave black males the right to vote, and the 14th, you could argue, is, is, is very, very important for the reason it's been used more times than any other. And the 14th Amendment talks about people being treated equally before the law. This is the 14th Amendment. And because it talks about those kinds of things and everybody has the right to due process, it's been used in case after case after case in front of the High Court. And the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868. So here we are in 2020, talking about the most important amendment being one passed in the three years after the Civil War, uh, the, the, the 14th Amendment passed in 1868. Um, these questions are very good, but I will tell you this, uh, we're going to probably take about uh, two, three questions at the most, and then I'm going to say adios, 
because I don't want to wear out my welcome tonight because I'm hoping that everybody who's with us tonight is going to join us tomorrow night when our focus is going to be the U.S. Supreme Court. And believe me, we will have fun. By tomorrow, we'll know if Justice Barrett became the ninth justice and all kinds of things. So tomorrow night, Supreme Court. We have time now for maybe uh, two more questions. Don't be shy. Margie, hit me with a question. All right, I'm going to ask, why were the first 10 amendments called the Bill of Rights? Well, let's, let's get the big picture there. First of all, there were people who voted against the Constitution and could not support it because the Bill of Rights were not there from the word go. James Madison felt that the things were getting bogged down. And he went to people and he said, look, we don't have time to add these amendments on now. Trust me, we'll add them on later. Some trusted James Madison. He was a trustworthy kind of guy. But others said, no, I cannot support a document that does not have these amendments from the get-go. And so they were either quiet or they actually opposed the, the Constitution being approved. Uh, these amendments, like all of the amendments, like the whole Constitution, are not passed in a vacuum. We have an electoral college because 99% of the people on planet Earth, when the Constitution was approved, lived under a dictator. You can call him a king, you can call him a queen, you can call him an emperor, you can call him whatever you want to call him, but I'll call him a dictator. So the idea of voting for presidents directly is absurd. That's why they, we have that middleman there. Maybe we shouldn't have it anymore, but that's why they created it. If you came to this country from England or any of the European countries, you were used to being bossed around. You were used to the police and the army coming and staying in your home because they chose to stay in your home. Your home was large, it was nice. Now, what does the Third Amendment do? No soldiers can stay in your home without your permission. In the European countries, if you're accused of a crime at that time, you're guilty of the crime. Please take a look at the first 10 amendments, and they are there to, to protect the accused. Don't worry about the Second Amendment. Everybody knows all about that, and the First Amendment. Those are fine. But what do the others do? The Third and the Fourth are concerned with search and arrest warrants. The Fifth Amendment is the right of the accused. The Sixth Amendment is the right to a fair trial. The Seventh and Eighth are concerned with bails, fines, and punishments, et cetera. So look at your first 10 amendments, especially, especially three through eight, and they are concerned with those people who you see in handcuffs on television being taken to a courtroom. They are innocent till proven guilty. Why is that important? It's important because the founding fathers knew the dictators can run amok if they're allowed to railroad people into jail cells without giving them due process. So if you're gonna worship the 10 amendments, that's fine. Please be aware that amendments two, I'm sorry, amendments three through eight are concerned with protecting the rights of the accused. No one's guilty in America ever until the jury foreman stands up and says, you're guilty, okay? Um, at this point here, because I don't want to wear out my welcome, and, uh, and I want to make sure I have some fire left for tomorrow night, uh, I'm going to sign off. I'll let uh, either Margie or Vicki do the official signing off. I appreciate you very much joining me. As you can maybe tell, I do have an interest in this topic. Tomorrow night, I'm hoping we can have just as much fun. Think of any kind of questions you have. And tomorrow night, it is the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court. Thank you so much for joining me.